A number of years ago, I read a book um, called It Came From Within. I've got it here, actually. found it on my bookshelf yesterday. Um, so this is it. It was written by a pastor called Andy Stanley, who you may have heard of before. He's written a few books. He's the senior pastor of a fairly large church in America. Um, I think it's called North Point Ministries. And in this book, he highlights that external events and circumstances don't corrupt us or cause us to stumble, that it's actually the ethics and the heart decisions that we make that bring about injustice or corrupt behaviour. So it comes intrinsically from within us. Today we're considering two scripture readings, which you've just heard, uh, Mark chapter 7 and James chapter 1, and we're also exploring our final week of serving with generosity or leading with generosity and I want us to consider how we cultivate a heart of generosity and in doing so, help us to orientate ourselves towards a more just future. So Andy Stanley, you might have, if you can see it on this cover, he uses old monster films to highlight this theme. Old monster movies where, you know, it came from outer space or it came from Mars or it came from the deep but he wanted to explore movies where the threat, the monster, came from within us. It came from within, hence the title. So you might remember the movie Aliens. Has anyone seen that movie? It's pretty old these days, but it's where the aliens have implanted their eggs inside the space colonists who go about their normal business um, like, they, like nothing's happened until suddenly the death um, they've been carrying inside them, burst forth and in, in their chests. It's pretty gross and it comes from within. He uses really old, to, by today's standards, pretty bad science fiction clips to highlight these points. And being that I'm a fan of movies, I don't want you to miss out. I'm a big fan of good cinematography and I wanted to show you this 1959 clip, The Giant Gila Monster. So let me get it ready. And um, by the way, it is nothing like good cinematography. But have a look, it's kind of funny. This engine's still warm. Say, did you see the skid marks out here? They go at a direct right angle to the direction of travel. No digs in the macadam either. Somebody was hurt. There's blood all over this thing. What is this black menace that kills everything it sees and hears? No human mind could imagine the enormous destructive power of this maddened, killing thing. If you're young people in love, look out. If you're driving a lonely road, you're as good as dead. There's been a lot of livestock missing lately. That doesn't make headlines, but now it's people. Never in the history of the United States, a monster of such size and power and horrifying hatred of man. <laughs> giant gila monster, the equivalent of a goanna for us here in Australia. The idea that Andy Stanley's getting at is that our real risks come from within us. And it's this great visual for our scripture reading today, especially Mark, the Gospel of Mark. Um, when Jesus makes the point that what defiles a person does not come from external stimuli. It comes from the decisions that we make internally from within the intrinsic motives, the intrinsic attitudes or beliefs of the heart that work its way out into action and behaviour. So I want to drill down a little bit further on this reading in Mark, and I'm going to reread it to you. 
from chapter 7. It says this, Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? So Jesus and his disciples are being criticised here for not following the same traditions that they'd been taught to follow. In this instance, it's purity laws. These laws over the years had become a national and religious identity marker that distinguished who was in and who was considered unworthy to participate in their shared life together. The disciples in our reading are eating without having gone through the ritual cleansing practices that were custom. And in doing so, according to, these, according to the religious leaders and the scribes, they'd made themselves unclean, unholy, outside of God's will. I want you to consider the passage for a moment. Remind yourself that we're hearing an almost 2,000-year-old account of an encounter between a a travelling teacher and a group of religious leaders. Jesus and his disciples' refusal to wash their hands ages fairly poorly, doesn't it? But at the same time, the teaching of Jesus is this entirely consistent um, lesson of modern psychology. Consider the washing of hands. You might be sitting here thinking, in these COVID times, thinking that the Pharisees were right and Jesus and his disciples were wrong. They should have washed their hands. Washing hands saves lives. We all know that these days, don't we? But back in those days, uh, people didn't possess some super scientific insight into germ theory. Instead, that they thought the ritual washing of hands offered supernatural protection, divine protection. The accusation that was being levelled at them was that because they weren't practising the purity laws of washing hands or instruments or not eating certain foods, that they were somehow unclean. And that because they were unclean, that they were on the social outer, or worse, they were living outside of God's favour. Jesus' response to them turns this accusation on its head. It's not the external things that cause you to be unclean or unholy or defiled. It's what comes from within. And in this teaching, Jesus is preempting much of the psychology of the last hundred years. Our actions are not caused by what happens to us, but instead by our internal thoughts and feelings. So you didn't swear at the driver because they cut you off. Instead, you swore because when they cut you off, you had an emotional reaction and you made a series of judgments and decisions that then led you to swear. If you've ever done any therapy, um, cognitive behaviour therapy or seen a counsellor, you've probably been asked questions. You know, questions like to reflect on how you're feeling or what you're thinking or how you could change um, your actions. Our actions come from within us. We're not this walking mess of reactivity, although sometimes we might feel like it. While the religious leaders were trying to discriminate and socially exclude groups who didn't observe these purity laws, Jesus is concerned with correcting that behaviour, with getting to the heart of the problem. Jesus is concerned with creating a community of inclusion where no one, I mean nobody, sits outside of God's favour. Jesus does this by addressing it, um, addressing them with another example to make the point. You see, in their society, there were certain obligations that children would care for their parents in their old age. I think they called it Corbin. Old age might have meant, you know, 50s at that time, but the custom developed 
um, called Corbin, where if you promised your wealth to God at some point in the future, then that excused you from needing to look after your parents now. No, mum, I'd love to help you with those bills, but this money I've promised to God when I die. So sorry. So the younger generations were acting completely within the boundaries of the purity laws and they twisted those laws to neglect their own family. And it gets worse because consider then um, the, the economic and the social implications of that. This behaviour leads to a group of people in the community who can't provide for themselves and don't have anyone else to care for them. They then can't meet their own religious obligations and they're excluded through poverty and neglect from their own community. The result? Another group of marginalised people. And in this, Jesus is like, it doesn't matter if you keep all these rules. It doesn't matter if you wash your plates or offer all your money to God or follow any of the other hundred laws that they'd established all in the name of purity. What matters isn't these external acts It's the internal world that motivates them. Jesus points out the intrinsic motives and intentions of the human heart are far more valuable and far more important than what enters the human body externally. And I really love that Jesus uses the process of how poo is created to do this. If you don't believe me, you need to go back and read it. Jesus essentially says there's no food that a person ingests that can defile them. It goes in one end, through a digestive tract, and out the other. A legal compliance which is loveless or which marginalises another person is completely worthless. Instead of being motivated by some twisted sense of legal compliance as doing the right thing, we need to be motivated by love. We need to be motivated by compassion. We need to be motivated by generosity. We talk a lot about love in churches, don't we? There probably isn't a week that goes by where we don't say something about love. And we know, if you've heard any of the Greek, that there's three words for love, eros or erotic love, philios or friendship, um, or agape or sacrificial love. You might also know that the old King James Bible used to translate agape um, or sacrificial love as charity, which does make some sense. Sacrificial love uh, that gives of itself without any thought of payment or self-benefit is close to what we would think of as charity, isn't it? But the word charity has come to have some baggage in our modern times. When we talk about charity, we might still be talking about giving, but there are also power dynamics involved, where the giver is separated from the receiver. We separate out out those who have and those who don't. Which position the person showing charity as somehow superior to the one who receives it. You know what I mean? So I want to use the word generosity. It conveys a lot of the same ideas. Generosity is loving. Generosity is giving of oneself. But at the same time, everyone can be generous. There's no power dynamic. We can be generous with the little we have or we can be generous with the plenty we have. Generosity is also active. It involves being and doing. And generosity builds this mindset of plenty rather than scarcity. In fact, it's actually a well-known leadership um, secret that generosity breeds generosity which grows an organisation. It's never about what we don't have or what we're missing out on. It's always about what we do have to share. And everyone can share something. Generosity is the inward state of love made manifest in action. So I want to jump briefly to the James passage. It follows a lot of the same ideas that Mark follows, but it highlights the good things that come from the human heart. 
Best yet, James shows how to adopt a posture of generosity, that is, how to cultivate a generous heart. So early in James, they mention the external temptations, um, and it makes the point that we can't blame those external temptations on what we choose to do. And then later, it talks about all the good things around us that we can't take credit for. And through it all is the same call to look at yourself, your thoughts, your heart, consider your actions and your own behaviour. But the passage does end with one of my favourite scriptures. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So generosity of service flows through these lines. Generosity, the inward state of love made manifest in our actions. James, this passage, this scripture in James, identifies widows and orphans as this target for love. And there are dozens of Bible references to widows and orphans, sometimes on their own, um, sometimes mentioned alongside the poor, sometimes amongst refugees or immigrants. The phrase is kind of used as this catch-all for whoever finds themselves disenfranchised. If we remember from our Mark passage, the purity laws of the Pharisees create marginalisation. They intentionally or unwittingly push people out of the mainstream towards the fringe. But it's abundantly clear that God is especially interested in how we treat people who are disempowered how we treat people who are disenfranchised, how we treat people who are excluded or the victim of corrupt decision-making. God is interested in the purity of our hearts, but this purity, our perfect religion, is actually made known in how we treat the least. Generosity is our inward state of love made manifest in action. So how do we lead with generosity? We practice it. How do we become more giving of ourselves to others? We learn to recognise the abundance of goodness that we've already been given. How do we grow that capacity to show kindness and compassion? James teaches us that we allow the word of God implanted in our souls to grow us in meekness. We recognise the model that we have in Christ, who out of love for God and us willingly went to the cross, not with some kind of resentment in his heart. He gave out of the abundance he recognised he'd already been given. With a willing submission, he suffered for us. May we also have that privilege of seeing the abundant goodness we have in our lives and out of that abundance, give generously. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the abundance of life that you have given to us. Whether we hold a little in our hands or a lot, we ask that you would help us to learn how to give freely of ourselves how to make decisions and ask questions about decisions being made in our world um, that might disempower or disenfranchise others. Help us to be a people that work for justice. Help us to be a people that ensure um, the voices of those that the world would like to silence are heard. Help us to live as you did, Jesus. Um, and if it includes suffering, help us to be willing to go down that road. We thank you for the many gifts you have given us. Amen.